I guess from a support perspective, one of the biggest questions we get is, is how do I work around a bug that exists, or how do I get access to underlying features of, uh, of the operating system that you know, isn't necessarily in Marmalade. So this session from, uh, from Nick is, uh, is how you can build EDK extensions to uh, extend the power of Marmalade. Thanks. Um, so it's not actually just about extensions. I <coughs> was asked to do a, a session on extensions and thought, I'm not sure you know, how familiar people will be with Marmalade generally, what kind of things you're doing with it. And um, also, as Lester said, there's often a bit of confusion about what is an extension. You know, if I want to bring, I mean, people tend to think I want to bring my content or expose my API or my bit of feature set on Marmalade, how do I do it? So there's kind of different ways to approach that, whether it's kind of middleware level or very low level. Um, and also, because extensions are sort of a, a newer feature of Marmalade, and we don't support it on every platform. There's things you've got to think about in terms of can I support X, Y, and Z at the moment? Um, if I can't, then you know, how do I get those Marmalade guys to allow me to support it? So what I thought I'd do is basically just do a kind of general run through of extending Marmalade, what your options are, and this is going to be a bit dull compared to the previous presentation. So I'm going to pull up some code and show you how to use our how GitHub repository and how um, projects, what they look like in a sort of text file manner, show a bit about how the build chain works. Um, I've brought a Mac along, so I'm going to use the Mac for a little bit if that extension adapter works. Um, yeah, so I've got to start off with basically Marmalade middleware rather than extensions. So when we saw the kind of Marmalade software stack earlier, you've got the, the C++ world where you're just building your app and it's sitting on top of our abstraction stuff. You're not touching any platform code or anything like that. Um, a lot of middleware is provided like this, so there'll be companies who you know, have some existing C++ stuff, they just want to get onto as many places as possible, and we're a good distribution for them, so people can integrate them into their apps. Um, sometimes people will have uh, their own kind of platform-specific versions, and then they'll bring out a C++ Marmalade version, because it's you know, easier for them. Um, so basically how, how those work is, in Marmalade you have an MKB project, which is basically a text file that says, you know, here are my files, here are my assets, this is how I want to condition it specifically for iPhone, so here are some iPhone icons, for example, that kind of thing. Uh, a sub-project in Marmalade is basically just uh, an MKB you can include in another MKB. So on the simplest level, some middleware might just be um, some C++ code using like, the standards we support and our own Marmalade system platform APIs. Um, you can include it as source code or libraries. Um, and we have a thing called MDEV for putting them down. So I'm kind of interested, has anyone ever used MDEV knowingly in a Marmalade project? So, oh, one person, brilliant. Um, so basically, I'll, I'll have like one little slide in a bit to talk about it. It's basically kind of like a repository system where you can upload um, sub-projects and middleware, and then uh, people's apps can just include them and pull them straight down from the web in a kind of, uh, kind of Linux repository kind of style. Um, basically, get them from, so we have a GitHub uh, repository on the website where we upload stuff, um, people make stuff and upload it themselves. Some of the things we include in the SDK, um, not a source at the moment, we'll have source versions up there because we figured, why not? I mean, more and more, we just we want to concentrate on, you know, there's the core platform abstraction stuff, and stuff on top of that, it's, it's really helpful to be able to edit it and do what you want with it. So we're putting more and more open source stuff up there. Um, and just to kind of recap, so the bit in the black lines is your C++ app world where middleware gets compiled into, um, and the Marmalade system is the abstraction bit below. So a basic sub-project, I'm just going to grab something from GitHub. Um, I hope I can get on the network. Um, I'm going to go with game SWF. So this is uh, like a flash action script renderer. It's quite old. Um, it's basically kind of a non-official but legal flash renderer that gets used in lots of things. For example, it's been used in some pretty high-end games I know of with Marmalade to do some nice kind of uh, comic book style front ends. Um, so I'm going to go download that from GitHub, or if I can't get online, I'll just, I've got a ready made version. <coughs> this version is just source code, so it's basically an MKF. It's got some C++ files, some other stuff like that in it. Let's go back one. Show you. So the GitHub repository looks a bit like this. This game SWF, um, and you can fork it, and you can add stuff to it, and not online. But 
Let's have a look at that. So I've downloaded one already. Here it is. Uh, so this has come with a little demo. So this is your regular Marmalade project. If I was to uh, open this up, it's got some pretty straightforward things. So compiling options, include parts, uh, the file, the source of the demo, so it's very minimal. Um, this thing here, package, this is for MDEV. So um, when I talk about MDEV, basically you'll see what I mean. Basically that's saying there's an MDEV package from Zeppelin. And then this is how you include a bit of middleware. So you just go to some projects and list them. So said that it's one of these NDEV ones. Game SWF is the one we're looking at here. And that is just saying, it checks in like local folders, so anything with the same name, anything on your include path, looks for an MKF like that. <coughs> um, and this has just got you know, some libraries it uses, some options, some compilers, uh, some uh, source code even, and then somewhere way down the bottom, it's probably got its own sub-projects. So it includes Zedlin itself already. Um, and because that source, you don't need to build anything, so you would just build your game like this. So on Windows, I've got it set up to use Visual Studio 10, I think. So you could pass this through the command line. <coughs> you can pick different compilers if you want to. And this is your kind of Visual Studio dev environment. So there's the sub project in there. And I can build that for desktop or ARM or MIPS. I've got RBC teams still in here, I think. So it's you know pretty straightforward, simple marmalade project there. Uh, I'm just going to switch back to the slides. Is it MDEV that um, prevents you from working with your project if you can't down, download the latest set uh, so, so what MDEV does is basically download it to uh, some kind of third party packages location on your marmalade installation. So whatever the default yeah. project file does it, checks yeah. every time. So it know. checks if it's there already, and if it's there already, it doesn't Can download it. it again. We have done some work to improve that, I know, in this version. It connects to a, a server. Yeah, which I think every is what... Every time you start on Visual Studio. Yeah, so I think this is what James may have mentioned earlier in some MDEV improvements. Right. Um, because I've never worked on MDEV, I don't know what the source is like, yes. but I found that incredibly annoying, especially if you're doing a demo, <coughs> and you're out somewhere and there's no internet connection and so on. Um, and I know that's basically been fixed. It's a bit scary that it could potentially do an auto update when you try to build a submission builder. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, I know basically a lot of that stuff has been fixed and improved. Um, and if there's things that you do or don't like about how it works and want to improve, then you should just uh, send us a line and just don't uh, update anything without specifically asking for it. I think yeah. Reasonable. I know it's got a versioning system now, so it can like uh, I don't actually know how that works. So, um, <laughs> but certainly you can pick like specific versions by a number. So that's very basic sub project. Uh, a library version basically just be the same thing, but instead of having source code, you have some libraries in, um, and you probably have a project to build the library yourself. So the reason I put you typically need source access is I think a lot of people come into the Marmalade world working on one specific thing where they think like, oh, I just take grab a library from wherever and it'll work. Um, and we support like a very straightforward cross-platform set of APIs and you know, C libraries and so on, but. Your typical library that you would just grab from somewhere online is usually built in a very specific way. Um, and the same applies for extensions. People think, like, I've got an iPhone library. I'll just drop that straight in. Um, <coughs> and for extensions, that will work more often than it will for a bit of middleware. But basically, ideally, you want to get some source code and compile it for Marmalade as a project. Um, you might be able to get something that just works. But it's just kind of, I think people aren't thinking in a kind of cross-platform way where they're like, I've got this tool chain, I've got these this standard set of APIs I can use, and you might have to update your project because it'll turn out whoever wrote the library originally used a lot of bizarre defines and things that aren't really meant to be used in the way they're used and so on. So you'll get errors where it's saying like Mac OS isn't, isn't defined and all that kind of stuff. So there is a bit of work basically to make libraries um, compile for Marmalade and, and to include them. And it's just something to sort of think about in terms of, you know, what is a library and you know, how am I going to include it in my project? So assume you've got source code to build your library from. Um, you'd have an MKF project, just like the one we saw a minute ago, that would include those libraries. Uh, this can include all the different versions. So basically, you have a libraries folder, and it'll have like you know, debug and release ones, ARM ones, and MIPS ones, and so on. Um, when you're using a project and just including the library, 
you don't need to worry about that stuff it'll, if, you're, if you're building for ARM, it'll pull in the ARM ones and so on. So the MKV system kind of takes care of all of that for you. Um, and then the public MKF will have like the headers and the libraries. Uh, and to build the library, you just do option live, so it's kind of like an, an output type. And then your application stuff the MKV. So an example I thought I'd pull up really quickly uh, is score loop. So score loop is uh, online high scores, achievements, kind of casual social gaming uh, platform. Um, and there's the Marmalade version. So for this, you just go to their website and go to their SDK section, click the Marmalade version, uh, and it just comes as an MKF. So this is your project. Uh, and inside, it's just got, that's where the libraries are, that's where the header files are, it uses HTTP, it's, it's pretty minimal. Um, and then the header files that you would get the APIs from, there should be some uh, docs in here, probably copy this from somewhere. Um, and then the libraries, so you know, when you make an ARM deployment to go on any phone, it'll pull the libraries out of there. So debugging the this version, x86 for desktop, and so on. So that hopefully is pretty simple. Uh, so MDEV, we've kind of talked about this, about as much as I know of it anyway. Um, but basically it allows sub-projects to be archived and downloaded automatically. So, so basically by using the package keyword or the package down from MDEV, there's new versioning stuff now which, as I said, I'm not exactly sure how that works, but will be documented in the new release. Um, MDEV tool search the repositories, so on Mac and on Windows, there's basically a list somewhere that just lists all the repositories. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, a, a, how you would work on a Linux machine, you're putting down apps and so on. Um, and the standard one that gets included is that one. I don't have an internet connection, so I won't be able to show you that. But if I fix on that, it would open up um, basically a list of things like libjpeg and so on, and they're all revised, like, you know, not from Marmalade, I think like four through to 6.1 now. So that's basically libraries. Any any questions on any any of that? It's pretty straightforward. We tried to make it so that you know it's not kind of rocket science to extend and package stuff up into your code. Yeah. What would it do with um, like Windows as your load balancing commands or something like that? Does it, it would it know anything about them or? I'm not sure. Like the Azure um, cloud interface, would it would it be able to do anything with that or? So stuff like that uh, is going to be something that you would work on at like an extension level. Oh right. Okay. right. So um, in terms of your libraries, literally all you've got access to is uh, the kind of C++ standard libraries, POSIX, and whatever else Marmalade includes for you, um, and that will include some under the hood stuff that we expose through. Our like S3 interface. Yeah, something um, like Windows 8. F3. Yeah. So when Windows 8 rolls out, some of that kind of stuff might might be things that we would include in there. Okay. Um, but the extension kit I'm going to talk about now might be sort of what you want to look into to expose that yeah. kind of tech. Um, so I think I had this up in the previous thing. Extensions are basically some projects you can build that will extend the Marmalade. Uh, system layer. So basically, you're like writing an extra bit for a uh, Marmalade system for our like, platform abstraction API. So totally separated from the idea of writing some C++ middleware that's going to compile into your app. This is, I want to do something on, you know, iPhone or Android or preferably everything um, that you guys don't provide yet. Um, and I want to find a way to do that without the Marmalade engineers having to go off and create this for me. Um, and you might want some C++ middleware to to manage that, but it's kind of like a separate thing. So what we do for this is we provide this thing, the extensions, uh, <coughs> the extensions development kit, or EDK, so you can access stuff that we don't expose. Um, what we're saying about the middleware part, it's quite nice to wrap similar APIs, either in a single extension at like the C level, um, or you can make uh, you know, things like, at the moment we have some billing APIs for different platforms, so we have like Google Play billing, iPhone billing, um, a couple of other ones I'm not sure. Um, 
which already exists as separate extensions. So you might write a bit of C++ middleware to push those together, so kind of hinting at that we're doing that at some point in, uh, in the, the roadmap future. Um, but the idea is that when you're writing this uh, low-level stuff, you want to expose it to your users in a nice cross-platform way if you can. So Marmalade users want to keep carrying on in their, with their C++ or their web Marmalade code um, and not worry about this platform implementation stuff. Uh, if you're providing middleware, it's a good way to provide existing iOS and Android SDKs. So if you've got an iOS SDK or something, an Android SDK or something, maybe a desktop one, um, you can package those up as a single Marmalade uh, you know, product that people can download as an SDK, sub-project it into their Marmalade projects and just use it. Uh, currently we support iOS, Android, Windows, Mac, and we're planning to roll it out to other platforms. So the one kind of thing to bear in mind with extensions is for platforms like, uh, at the moment, the battery platforms and the smart TVs and so on, they're not supported by the EDK. But we do, we can still provide extension type stuff uh, officially, you know, by just adding it into the loaders. But we would prefer to support that across platforms. So it's kind of ongoing work to extend extensions beyond uh, those four. So basically, how the extensions kit works is you get uh, an S4E file. And this is what powers your extension. It's basically a header. You Write your API with a few little sort of just you know a few little kind of syntax bits about how it's going to work. Um, it's all kind of built into a system. So uh, on Windows, you can just right click on that file and do like build me an extension. Um, at which point, so if you build an iPhone extension from it, it would give you uh, an MKB like the normal Marmalade project file, but for iPhone. Um, and then it could also do an Android one or a Windows one or a Mac one. Um, and then from this point here, it kind of diverges from your normal Marmalade usage. So normally on Marmalade, you're using a single tool chain, you're using Visual Studio or Xcode as like your IDE, but it's all being built the same to create this one binary under the hood. Um, at this point with extensions, you're using like the native tool chain. So if you want to build an iPhone extension, you have to use a Mac and the iOS SDK, but you can put in any of the iPhone libraries you want. You can do whatever you want with it to build your your iPhone extension library. <coughs> Same with Android. So um, on iPhone you code in Objective C if you want. On Android you can use Java. Uh, on Windows you could use Windows APIs and so on. So that's the point where if you're doing Windows APIs, you wanted to put in some Metro stuff that isn't used out of the box in Marmalade when we when we eventually support that, then you could just write that straight into there. Um, as usual, like when I double clicked on the MKB to open Marmalade projects, in this case it'll open up the relevant kind of projects so you can use Eclipse to build your Android ones. Uh, uses the native tool chain as I said to build it to a library and then you basically want it with a package which is all those libraries for all the platforms you've built for. So from a user's point of view they would just go sub project the name of that Marmalade extension library and then it'll call through the Android bit or the iPhone bit or whatever. Um, <coughs> and the deploy tool takes care of all of the how that gets packaged into the app and so on. So from a user's point of view, they would go, oh, well, these guys have provided a Marmalade extension for their billing API across Windows, iPhone, and Android. They would download that, and they would get a sub-project out of it. They would go sub-project the billing API. They would build. They wouldn't see anything unusual happening. They'd be clean, C++ as normal. And then at the end, they'd hit deploy, and it would package up all the libraries for them. So it's designed to be totally transparent to end users. Um, it's the people that are building extensions you need to think about. Right, I'm working for Mac now, I'm working on Android now. How do I, you know, how do I code differently? How do I want to package this up to be a nice, useful interface for my users? Um, any questions about any of that? No, maybe not. Uh, if someone were to write a, an extension, uh, say they know that the interfaces are there on iOS and Android, yeah. or whatever, but didn't have a Mac. Yeah, I mean, could write the Android one. Is it something yeah. you'd consider doing the the Mac side, or the, the iOS side rather? Uh, you mean getting us or someone else to yeah, do that to finish it? Um, potentially, yeah. I mean, we we create extensions ourselves when you know when there's demand for them or when we want to do them. Uh, we give the EDK out so that people can create them. Uh, we do a lot of work with partners. So we have a kind of partner program where both for the C plus plus middleware and for the extension side where we go. People say, oh, we want to use, we want to have a Marmalade plugin, and we say, oh, we want your stuff on Marmalade. Um, and who does the work? It <coughs> depends on you know, yeah. demand and so on. Um, at the moment, you have to use a Mac to build uh, iOS ones, for example. Uh, I mean, that may not be true forever. 
So, um, probably will be. Probably. <laughs> probably <laughs> need to be cute forever. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, it's worth thinking about. I mean, there are, you can, for example, uh, you can host um, by uh, Mac server time to build remotely. That's pretty legal now in the iOS world. Um, on the virtual machine. Yeah, yeah, I saw a hosting thing the other day. <laughs> So, I mean, that's an option, but yeah, if you've got something interesting you want to bring to Marmalade, just um, contact us through the website, through the Partners Program, and tell us what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody else has, then um, yeah, we're always interested in integrating new tech, giving new stuff to users, and you know, providing more value all around. So, I'm just going to do a really quick extension walkthrough to show you kind of what it means in practice. Uh, I'll have an SRE file to generate stuff. Uh, that's all pretty straightforward. So um, what I did was I pulled down this thing, iCloud. So this is just a little, um, from GitHub, it's kind of an extension to do some iCloud implementation. What they've done here, and how clear this is, is, uh, so this is your S4E file here. Um, and actually, what would be easier to start with is if I just copy paste this. So if I was building this extension from scratch, um, I would write a file like this, S4E. Uh, and inside it's got, it looks like a header, so it's got some, oh, this one's nicely commented. This is a nice change from how people usually do coding. Uh, it's got some things like callbacks here, which has some built-in automatic callback generation. You can do things like um, automatic error handling and stuff like that. <laughs> um, and then it's got, you know, some types in an include section and some functions to do things. So I think this is pretty straightforward. It starts up iCloud uh, and writes some stuff to file and gets it back again. And basically how this works is, assuming I've installed an SDK on this machine, I can right click this and just do build extension. So if I want to start building an iPhone extension, I'll hit that. And it should generate kind of stub stuff for everything I want to do. So. This here is our sub-project that our users are going to eventually include in their app to go like sub-project iCloud once it's built. Uh, this is a kind of generic build file and this is iPhone. So when I run this, it's going to build the iPhone version of it once I've actually added some source code. Uh, and it's built a header out of our sub-public header that it's built. Uh, and in the source, it's built some nice stub stuff for you. So there's like a generic uh, ver version of all those functions that I declared. There's some wrapper for, I think that's the callbacks thing, so it's set up a callback system for me. Uh, and then in the iPhone one, it's by default built an objective C++ file with some stubs in there that you can start adding code to. So if I switch back to the... Um, Would that automatically have stuff to say it's not available on Android? Yeah, so um, one thing that's in the... Uh, switch back to the original version, in the S4E, is that the slightly difference from a normal header is that at the end of a function, you have a standard return type. So basically, I mean, it's not a very good example of void, but uh, this one here, basically, if the platform doesn't support the function, it'll just return that code there. So it'll never crash, but it's not gonna necessarily do anything useful. So if you run that on a, um, any device, like you know, a playbook, say, rather than an iPhone, it's just gonna return some kind of void or null. So it's code kind of one, so you don't have to say. Yeah. If you don't have to keep going if iPhone then, if Android then. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the other bits, you've got things here like, these are sort of a directives of things that it'll do automatically. So run on OS thread is a kind of common one, but basically most platforms, and this is documented in the docs, if you're doing anything with built-in UI, UI kit stuff, uh, that always has to run on a specific thread. So that just makes sure that that gets marshaled through the right thread so that stuff works, basically. So. Um, is a few kind of helpful things like that to save you having to, in your code, switch between threads and nasty stuff like that. Um, I thought I'd have a quick look at the Windows version. So uh, to get this, I would have just right clicked this and gone uh, build Windows extension. I wrote the code, imagine I did that. And then if you double click on this, so the Windows one will build on Windows. You get a project as usual. If I open it up, uh, you'll see. That's the extension and its source and so on. That's the project building it. And this will have, so I can build a Windows debugger release uh, library out of it, basically. Um, on iPhone, for example, so if I'm going to try just switching to this. 
which may or may not work. Yes, okay. So this is the same project downloaded. Uh, and on here you can see there's an iPhone one from when I did build iPhone earlier. And so if I was a Mac developer used to building uh, you know, iOS stuff, I can open this up, build your next code project, and I can just hit run to build the libraries. And you've got, you can use the normal debugging tools to um, ex do uh, Xcode. So this is basically like just having a an actual normal iOS project that's got a, a library as its output type. Um, and just to show you, the libraries that get built, so you've got a folder here, so there's, a, there's the iPhone version, there's the Windows version. If I made an Android version, I'd have an Android folder, and so on the way down. So that's uh, it's basically how extensions work. So, uh, any questions about any of that? Yeah. Once you've initially built your extension and it's yeah. generated all that code, what's the recommended way to add additional functions? Right. So, you can basically, there's no kind of like. Because obviously, know, it doesn't, obviously, it won't touch certain files because you added code in those files. Yeah. So, um, when you first right click and go like, you know, generate automatic source, um, it'll build the source for you. There's no built in that I'm aware of functionality for like add more stuff to that feature. When you start writing an extension, you don't know the exact what the thing's going to be in it. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, that would be a pretty easy thing to, to improve. There's another one actually. The S4E file parsing is a bit fragile. There's things you can do that'll generate broken code very easily. If you declare a function with like parameters, that was one. There's a thread on the forum somewhere. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll look that up. This. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that passing, because it's passing basically what looks like a header, it's not passing some kind of nicely formatted XML type file. Um, and as you were saying earlier about, you know, it's, no, it's input the, formats and stuff, yeah. that might be one that would be nice to switch to, like some XML or something. Um, it's nice because it's easy to use because it looks like a header. But, um, yeah, as you said, there's kind of fragility from the fact that you can introduce. It's the adding additional functions that can get a bit confusing yeah. because you're not sure which bits it's generated where you need to fill in the gaps. Yeah, um, one thing to note in the S3 files, basically, as you add things in order, it'll, um, the way that eventually be, kind of becomes a part of the loader, um, you get these kind of basically stubs that are all in a specific order, so you can't switch those about. Um, so as you add new things on the end, they'll basically, the position will be on the end of the existing code. Um, there are, there are, there are um, there's like a director basically to switch the order of them around, so if you were like hacking your code around and didn't really move things about, you could, I mean, the only reason to do that basically for backwards compatibility, so that you know something that's already using that code can be uh, deployed again without recompiling. But if you recompiled your app, it, it wouldn't matter anyway. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I was going to do a few little tips and stuff. Basically, those options like run on main, th main thread and callbacks and stuff are pretty handy. Um, and if there's anything people would like to see, you know, getting into that, stop you having to write the same code over and over again, then um, we're happy to add that kind of stuff. Um, there's some specific APIs for loader internals. So writing, uh, taking some existing Android code, say, and making it run as a Marmite extension is pretty straightforward. The things that get people are things like when they want to integrate UI stuff into like the core app and have it play nicely with other UI stuff that other people have integrated with the core app and so on. Um, there's some straightforward things like give me the main window, tell me, you know, what version I'm running in Android, that kind of stuff. Um, but you might want to go a bit deeper than that. So you can basically just, um, in Android, 
grab the main class and then just access it in any way you want. So you've got a pretty good uh, opportunity to hack around as much as you want with that, um, for better or worse. And same on iPhone, you can basically get hooked to the application and start overriding stuff. We try to document how, you know, what our stuff is doing and that's how you should be interacting with it. But uh, it's something we definitely want to improve to give people like easier ways of just you know throwing in some UI without having to know how a view hierarchy works and so on. I yep. apologise for in advance of being utterly evil, but could you yep. wrap an entire Android application as an extension and get it to run on iOS um. and on iPhones? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, well, not, not as the standards. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that you can do um, that you wouldn't be allowed to do, I would say, in terms of uh, getting that stuff to run. Uh, so, oh yeah, so there's some docs for that, obviously, but as I said, if you'd like to do a bit of work to get more into those. Um, and another thing to bear in mind, so iOS, our whole sort of deploy chain for iOS is a bit different to other platforms. It's basically to keep it legal and comply with what an app is meant to be to get onto the App Store. So one thing to notice is that um, iOS extensions are basically static libraries, um, and when you deploy an iOS extension, um, it actually gets compiled, compiled into your app in a slightly different way. So normally we have like a, we have a loader and we have your signal app binary, and they kind of mush together in some magical way, um, and that's true on our, on all the platforms for an app. Once you start using extensions on iPhone, it's a slightly different version of the loader. It's basically a static library that gets relinked at deploy time. Um, so it won't actually change how any of the code runs, it'll still be exactly the same binary running, but it's just something to bear in mind that it's actually working in a slightly different way. It gives you a little kind of nice thing that basically you can link in any old uh, iPhone library at the end if you want. So there's some, uh, part of how the extensions work is they set up some deployment options to make the extension library get linked in, um, and you can actually take like th third party libraries and just link them in at the end there, um, for better or worse. So. Yeah. Is there, is there a way to put those uh, additional uh, libraries to the project uh, using only the extension MKF file? Because this needs to be added to the project MKF file. Uh, so that's in the uh, MKF for the extension project. Oh. So um, once you've built your basic extension project, you can start including the libraries. And you don't have to put the, those libraries in the MKF uh, no, not for the application. So when you build a library, it'll, it'll generate this bit automatically, and the my extension bit will be the, the library for your extension, and then the rest is like whatever you want to do. And I think that's be done. So a any questions about any of that? It's, uh, yeah? Yeah, uh, related to the Android um, EDK. Actually, I just worked with that yesterday, and there's two Java classes for which I couldn't find uh, documentation. I'm not sure if you mentioned something about that, but um, I was able to uh, like um, find somebody put like a source code for those online. Yeah, so you found out what they were from the that. The other class, I forgot the name, one was Loader API, and the other one was something else. Maybe S3 something, I'm not sure. I don't um, remember, but I decompiled it in the end to just figure out what it does. Yeah, so that's the nice thing with Java, that, that you, can just, uh, you can just pull the information out of it. Um, those things should be a bit better documented, basically. Um, the reason it's like that is because they're parts of the loader that were never originally intended to be public, and then we decided, let's build extensions, let's, let's let people do new and exciting things with it. Um, but some of that stuff isn't, isn't well documented. With Java, as you said, it's kind of nice, it documents itself. But um, yeah, so I mean, things like that, there's work going on to make that documentation better, and just you know, make a little complaint, tell us what you'd like to see, and we can tell you. Okay. All right. Thanks very much again. Yeah.